Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the Cloud Native Web Assembly Day. Um, in this talk, we're going to talk about AI inference, you know, how to do artificial intelligence with WebAssembly. And where do we use it? It's probably um, on the edge of the cloud, you know, so we put AI inference on the edge cloud. So my name is Michael Yuan, and I'm from a company called Second State. Um, so this talk is about how WebAssembly make it easy to run TensorFlow inference functions in production on edge devices and platforms, okay? Well, so um, before we start getting to the, the, the details of WebAssembly, let's talk, let's spend a couple of minutes to talk about AI, you know, that's deep learning and AI is a hot topics today, right? So um, when people talk, think about AI, people think about the data, the algorithms and all that, you know, that's how everyone loves to train the greatest AI. However, you know, um, after years of development with uh, deep learning, I think, um, you know, most people in the industry has realized that training the AI is not the difficult part now. You know, it's uh, it's pretty much a low code work. You know, you don't even to need to be a programmer. You just need to know how to run a Python script, right? You know, how to collect those data, collect those data and how to um, label those data and then feed that into a, into a computer algorithm. Yeah, then you get your, um, you know, TensorFlow model or, you know, Onyx model or whatever, right? However, most of the work is actually, most of the engineering work at least is actually on the inference side is to, when you have a AI model is, that's, that's trained and when you use it in your production system to say, to recognize part of speech or recognize image, recognize face, you know, whatever you train the, the algorithm for, you know, that's is the bulk of the, um, consume the bulk of the computing power that's associated with AI today. So if you look at this graph, you know, that's estimated from 2019 and the training only takes like 5% of the computing power and the inference is 95%. So in order to um, deploy your AI system or deep learning system in production and to do it efficiently, uh, we have to optimize for that 95% that inference part. However, there's, um, Inference is very important, it's 95% of the work, but it's also difficult to optimize. Uh, if you look at this graph, you know, there's uh, each dot, uh, each of the blue dots represents a trained um, AI model for image recognition, okay? And uh, on the x-axis, it's the time it's need, required to run this model. And on the y-axis is, um, is the accuracy of this model. So you can see the accuracy goes from 70% to 85%. It's about 20% improvement for the, for the accuracy. But the time needed to run ranges from a couple milliseconds to over 30 milliseconds. So in order to get 20% improvements in accuracy, the model has to run seven times, eight times as long. So that means it's difficult to scale those models, right? You know, so when you have those models, um, you, if you have a slightly more accurate model, you need a lot more computing power. So to save computing power, to make the models run as efficient as possible becomes a, a major issue in deploying those models in production. You know, when you need to deploy those models in production, you really do need to pay attention how efficient they are, how efficient you can make them run, right? So, you know, that's, um, so, Let's look into several ways. That's how people, um, you know, um, run their TensorFlow models for inference. So here, so the title of this slide is why not Python, right? You know, so the official TensorFlow serving is a application is a Python application because Python is easy to use. A lot of people use it to train the model. So it only stands to reason that people use it for inference as well. Once you train the model in Python, you can see the model in action in Python and then can, you, perhaps you can you can use it in production as well. However, Python as a language is very inefficient. You know, there has been a study that's, you know, there's, um, um, it's, it's a famous study that published on the journal Science. It's, uh, you know, the, the authors took a machine learning algorithm and uh, implemented it in Python and then C. Um, the C version is 60,000 times faster than Python. So it's four orders of magnitude just by switching to a different language. As a result, you know, when you use, when you say I'm doing machine learning or TensorFlow in Python, it's actually, doesn't actually do bulk of the bulk of the work in Python. You know, it's uh, under the hood, the Python functions actually cause the C libraries, the, the TensorFlow libraries written in C. 
right? So the, the workload is actually done in native code written in C. So, you know, that's, that's sort of, you know, how people get uh, reasonable performance out of Python. You know, Python is mostly just the interface language, you know, that's uh, makes the system easy to program and easy to use by, um, you know, by um, the developers, right? You know, that's, uh, um, and then when you really need heavy lifting, when you need, really need computation, you um, go down to the C libraries, it goes down to the native library, TensorFlow libraries written in C, right? However, even then, the data pre-processing and post-processing are still written in Python, right? You know, because when you read, uh, say, if you have a, um, you know, image recognition model, that's you have to read the image and uh, resize it and flatten it to make it appear to be the size of the tensor you want. And then feed that to the TensorFlow model and then to get the, the result from the model and then map the model result back to a metadata file or label file to figure out what's the English name for the objects that are, that's on that image, right? So that process, only 10% of the work is actually done running the TensorFlow model itself in native code or, or, or in C library. And the most of the data pre-processing and post-processing are still written in Python. You know, if, uh, if, you, are, you, if you are writing this entire application in Python. So 90% of the work is slow and can be uh, heavily optimized. As we can see, you know, there's orders, there's orders of magnitude of performance can, you can achieve by just using a different language. And of course, there's other issues when, you know, when we talk about edge computing, when, you know, because our, a very large use case of AI is on the edge, right? You know, so you say if you have a door camera and uh, you have, uh, um, you have trained it to recognize all the people in your, in your, in your household. And uh, so it would, uh, uh, rec it, it, when see a new person that's standing in front of your door, it would be able to tell whether it's, uh, it's a person in the, in the household or it's, it's someone else, right? You know, it can unlock the door or, or you know, do, you can do things like that. And uh, um, for things like that, you want it to run to, you, you want the AI model to run either on the camera or in the house, on the router or in the server in the house, you know, something of that nature. You don't want it to go all the way back to the internet. And uh, not only because the performance would be, um, you know, to run it on the remote server, say in New York, right? You know, that would be, um, you know, you would see a big performance impact, but also because you don't want the data to leave your house because for privacy reasons. And of course, you know, another, you know, very important uh, use case is self-driving cars, right? Uh, you have cameras and all that, and uh, you need those, those data to be processed in real time on the edge inside of the car, not go back to somewhere, else. Not, not, not to go to the cloud and process and then return to the internet. So in, in many of those cases, Python doesn't run any of those devices. You know, it doesn't run very small devices. It doesn't run a very old Linux operating system. It doesn't run a real-time operating system. You know, so there are lots of issues. And Python, of course, offers limited support in, in, web, and, um, in web and application frameworks. It's, you know, there's, um, you know, there's only certain frameworks that works with Python. And there's many others that's, that's um, um, you know, for, for instance, in you Node.js. Know, it'd be difficult to call a Python program from Node.js. It's possible, but it's um, not as easy. So the little table I have here shows the performance characteristics of different programming languages. And you can see C++, by, of course, by far is the best. And Rust has come to a very close second. And Java, you know, it runs fast enough, but it consumes a huge amount of memory, a hundred times more memory than everywhere else. And uh, for Python, it runs very slow. It's hundred times slower than everyone else and consume a reasonable amount of memory. So that's the performance characteristics of Python, make it, uh, making it uh, suitable for, uh, for AI training, but not suitable for using AI, inf using AI inference in production. So now we have established C++ has the best performance and Python may not, right? So what about native applications? Why don't we just write all our applications in C and C++? Um, you know, or at least the AI inference functions in C and C++, right? You know, that's, uh, um, it's like the TensorFlow's library is already written in C. So, you know, why can't we write our application around it in C as well? Um, but to do so, we basically give up all the advances that we made in the past 40 years of computer engineer, software engineering, which is the goal to make software safer, to make software more secure, right? And to make, so to make, it, easy, to make it easier for developers and to make it easier for users as well. So, you know, um, 
specifically, if you if we are writing C applications in native code and then run AI inference, we have the problem of the, the, the software being tied to a specific OS or hardware platform. It's not portable anymore. And you can't, um, you know, that's especially a problem uh, for edge computing where you have, um, you know, uh, you may have a variety of different CPUs and, uh, um, and, and operating systems on different devices, right? And um, um, it cannot be managed and orchestrated because it's a native application just to start it and it could crash and it cannot be managed and stop. You know, that's, uh, um, it's difficult to do that. Um, it's, it's not safe. It's crashes from bugs or attacks. You know, that's, uh, um, it could, uh, um, you know, you could make a mistake and uh, it crashes the whole system, right? It's costly grained. There's no, um, you know, the access control is done at the operating system level. You know, so it's uh, whoever the user, the, the 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 user who runs the application would have, the, the application would have the same privilege and permission as a user who runs it, right? You know, so if the, if you have a root user that runs the application, you have access to the entire system, and which is generally a bad thing. So the native application, there are lots of issues with native application. That's why you know, uh, twenty years ago. Java gained popularity because of JVM, and then after that, you know, uh, Docker gained popularity as well. You know, that's uh, because it provides isolated runtime and portable runtime for developers to run their applications. So we don't want um, just native applications. We want something that is uh, that is more modern, but also have high performance, not slow performance like Python. Right? So web assembly to the rescue. You know, that's uh, um, so. We have two conflicting goals. You know, that's one is to have super high performance, and the second is um, to have security, safety, and the ease uh, ease of use, and all those nice features that a container will give you. So, the best of both worlds, the compromise can be reached through something called web assembly. Through web assembly, that's why we're here to discuss. You know, a cloud native web assembly, right? So, so this pro particular project that we are discussing here is a new sandbox project that we have contributed to the CNCF, and it's called Wasm Edge, and it's also called SSVM, which is a production and second state VM, or Wasm Edge, WebAssembly on the Edge, right? So WebAssembly has some really interesting advantages over, um, you know, over both um, a, a fully managed application and also over native applications. The first is high performance. It's much more performant than say Python or Node.js or, or JavaScript or, or even Java in the JVM. And this has sandbox safety. It's a, um, it's, it's a sandbox it's a, um, that contains the, the, the native application. So it has safety. It has capability-based security, meaning that um, when you start a web, WebAssembly VM, you can uh, give it you know, a set of policies or rules um, uh, what kind of system resources it can access. So it's, um, that allows the WebAssembly runtime to have a different set of security and permissions than the users who run it, right? And it's language agnostic in, in a way. So, you know, that's uh, meaning that any front-end language that can be programmed that can be compiled to LVM is going to run on WebAssembly. Although uh, languages that requires a large runtime become somewhat impractical to run on WebAssembly. For instance, you know it's difficult to get Java or Python running on it. However, for Rust, C, Swift, Tiny Go, and you know languages like that, you know that's uh, um, it's you can compile all those languages to WebAssembly and and just just run them in a virtual machine in a, in a, in a Wasm virtual machine. And the last thing is we we see a product community fit here. You know, meaning that. Um, you know, there's a large, already a large community for, for WebAssembly products, and there are lots of people contributing, which we thought is a, it's a crucial factor for success of the technology, right? So um, to sum it up, you know, from our point of view, we see the Rust programming language on the front end and the WebAssembly on the, on the back end, roughly equivalent to the Java programming language plus the JVM about 20 years ago. So we believe maybe this thing can, can be as important or as uh, grow as big as Java. So this is um, um, the WebAssembly runtime that we have donated to, to the uh, CNCF. Um, you know, if you're interested, you know, just uh, um, like it on GitHub or, you know, fork it or check out, just generally check it out and see, you know, this is a, uh, a popular WebAssembly VM spe specifically optimized for high performance applications outside of the browser. So there's a bunch of WebAssembly um, VMs that's designed for the browser use case, but this is not, this is designed for the server, 
for the use case outside of the browser, meaning it's in, um, on the server or as a, or in the cloud, right? And uh, it's called bottom edge, you know, it's web assembly on the edge. So in the next couple of slides, I want to talk, um, you know, using bottom edge and SSVM as examples to talk to you, to, to discuss the web assembly's approaches to TensorFlow inference. How do you do TensorFlow inference in web assembly? We all know how to do it in C, C++. We also know how to do it in Python but how to do it in WebAssembly and what has the implications. So the first is the easiest one to, uh, for developers to understand is to just run WebAssembly interpreted on the CPU. You know, so the TensorFlow op operators are implemented in Rust or C++. It is then compiled to WebAssembly and then um, on the host machine's CPU, we, we execute this program and read a TensorFlow model and then you know, um, execute those, those, those operators. And uh, uh, here is example. You know, there's uh, we have a uh, we have an example of this approach in, this, in our repository. It does image recognition, so it takes about ten minutes to do uh, to recognize to do an image recognition on a modern CPU. So it's a very long time. You know, it's uh, the performance is obviously not acceptable, but you know that's uh, um, but that's that's um, perhaps the most straightforward way to do it, right? You know, so um, you know you provide an implementation of the TensorFlow operators in, in WebAssembly and then, you know, use the interpreter to, to, um, to run them. You know, that's, uh, that's our benchmark. It takes about 10 minutes. A much better way is to do the just-in-time compilation. So it's the same Web, WebAssembly application, but it runs in a JIT runtimes like V8. Um, for the, GI, the the way JIT runtime works is that it's no longer interprets WebAssembly instructions step by step. It tries to compile it as it runs it, right? You know, so most of the execution happens in the native environment. So in that case, we immediately see a 300 to 500 times boost in performance. You know, the same image recognition task now takes two three seconds. That's great, right? You know, that's a uh, that's essentially how TensorFlow.js does it, right? You know, that's a, it's a official TensorFlow library for in-browser application or for mobile devices. That's um, it's um, it runs inside the uh, JIT WebAssembly runtime. Of course, we can go one step further to say, you know, um, the JIT compiler compiles things as it goes, right? You know, so as a VM and executes the program, it compiles it. We can compile AI models directly into WebAssembly bytecode programs. That allows us to save the time to needed to map TensorFlow operations to WebAssembly operations at runtime, right? You know, because TensorFlow model consists of a series of TensorFlow operations. The, the WebAssembly program, what it does is to read the TensorFlow model and then execute those, those, uh, those, those operations. If we combine those two steps, we just you know, the steps that needed in WebAssembly to execute this, this TensorFlow operator is built directly into the WebAssembly, uh, into the WebAssembly application. That would make it run even faster. So in that case, the image recognition task takes one to two seconds, which I, uh, I have to say is more or less acceptable for internet applications now. You know, that's uh, if, if you have something in the web page, on a web page that it can recognize a face in one to two seconds. I think that's, for most people, it's acceptable, right? So um, representative examples of those is the TBM project, the Apache TBM project, which compiles TensorFlow models directly into WebAssembly. And uh, on the second state Qualcomm work with, uh, for the Onyx compiler for Wasm uh, compiles um, you know, an Onyx model, uh, AI model directly into WebAssembly and runs on Qualcomm hardware. Let's take it one step further, you know, because Let's recall how Python does it. Python does, you know, does not call TensorFlow library in the interpreter, in the interpreter, or in a JIT compiler. What it does is that um, when the Python program needs to run a, a TensorFlow model, it drops out of the Python and into the native C++ in C environments and runs the TensorFlow model there, and then it gets a result and it goes back to the Python environments. We can do exactly the same with WebAssembly as well. So we can call native WebAssembly libraries from, uh, we can call native TensorFlow libraries from WebAssembly. You know, we, uh, we provide a Rust API that, that compiled down to TensorFlow calls. And um, um, then, your, then your image 
then your data preparation and the post processing work can still be written in a high, in a in a um, in a highly optimized and high performance language like Rust. So to do so, um, we can show that uh, the image recognition task now takes half a second. That's two thousand times improvement from the original interpreted mode, right? You know, so an example of this is SSVM with WASI TensorFlow. It's a Rust SDK and the WebAssembly extension that we wrote for the um, for for the SSVM, which we donated to CNCF. Of course, now um, because um, the TensorFlow model is run um, in a native library, right? In a, written by written C C plus plus, that particular native library can now take advantage of the the hardware features that are on that particular device, right? So we can use, um, you know, ahead of compilation te techniques, the AOT compilers to optimize for data preparation tasks that seem wasm. We can run the TensorFlow library on specialized hardware, such as, you know, AI chips or GPUs and, you know, things like that. And the image recognition task now takes, sees a, another tenfold improvement. It now only takes 0.05 seconds to recognize an image. Right, you know, that's, um, in that case, we can do um, 20 image recognitions per second. The full video speed is 30 frames per second, right? So it's close to a, uh, to real-time video. So if we have a real-time video feed, we would be able to run our model on it and see what's in, in, each, of the, in each of the video frames. So the SSVM on Tencent serverless um, shows an example of this. It's a, it's a, it's a very nice example that um, shows you a web page and allow you to upload a picture, and it tells you what kind of food item is on that picture. The 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 whole application takes about five minutes to deploy. It's a very nice way to demonstrate the power of this approach. So now, show um, you know um, for the next for the remaining of this talk, I have about five minutes left. So um, I want to show you some code, you know, to show you how simple it is. You know, to use to run a TensorFlow model in in WebAssembly using the approach I have just dis discussed, the WASI TensorFlow approach. Right? You know, so there's a function um, in that's written in Rust. It's called infer, and uh, the infer function takes uh, a data array that that represents the image, and uh, come back with a string, which is a text description of what's in the image. Right? And so that's the method signature, and uh, in this screen you can see it's read the image. And then it's resize the image, and then it's flatten the image into um, a, a predefined format that can be consumed by the by the um, TensorFlow model. Now, in the next in, in this slide, we read the TensorFlow model, and we read the labels associated with the model. Meaning, um, you know, there's there's you know when we tell when, when we try to we try to train the model for what's on the picture. We give the model labels, right? You know, this picture has cat, this picture has dog, you know, things like that. So those labels are, are in this label file. And then we have a really simple API to run to run a TensorFlow session. And then we gave the flattened image as input and then get the output, the predictions output from the from the TensorFlow model. So in, in, in this process, we drop to the operating system and run this model and get the result back. Now we get the result back. The result is in the array. It's in the array of probabilities. You know, say if the um, if the data has, um, if the model has a hundred associated labels, it's gonna get a hundred numbers, and each number corresponding to the probability of that label on that image, right? You know, so if the uh, if the if the label corresponding to cat is has probability of 0.8. That means there is 80% of chance this this picture contains a cat, right? So um, here we just sort the return tensor, the return array, and find the object with the largest probability. Find the the index with the largest uh, probability, and then from there we we go to the um, the labels file, the metadata file, to find out what that largest probability correspond to, and then generate an English description for the model, right? You know, so that's. This whole Rust program is now compiled, can now compile into WebAssembly and run on SSVM in the um, in the cloud, in the edge cloud, and uh, um, that's that would would allow it to detect, you know, uh, objects from from any image that you send to that cloud service. Right? 
So if you're interested, here are some, you know, there's the, we have the source code, we have the demo and we have the tutorials and uh, um, make sure you, you know, if you're interested to check them out. So what's next? There's, uh, there are lots of things there, the field is still young and, uh, um, but I think it solves a real big problem. You know, it's how to deploy uh, production ready um, AI inference application, right? You know, um, in a manner that is, um, that is secure, that is safe, that is, um, you know, developer friendly, right? You know, so um, there's many things that we can do to improve what we have done in, so far. At first, we can support the WASI neural network specification, which is a, which is a specification uh, developed by the community to unify, you know, the, uh, different AI model, different AI model approaches, right? So the approach we took is very uh, so far is very TensorFlow specific. It's called WASI TensorFlow, right? So the WASI N specification can accommodate more uh, more AI frameworks, and uh, we are committed to work with uh, people in that specification group. Right? And provide more SDKs for front end languages, which we just saw. We have a Rust SDK, and we call those APIs in those SDKs to run TensorFlow inference. But we can do that for, for other languages that's supported on Web as well. And on the other hand, other end is to support more AI frameworks on the back end of TensorFlow, beyond the TensorFlow, right? So there's Onyx models, Paddle Paddle, Tengen, MKNet, and MXNext. You know things like that. You know those. Um, you know you can just uh, the idea is that you can just plug in a different model and then run the exact same code and uh, then you would uh, um, be able to utilize that model, right? More AI hardware. You know that's um, that's could be supported by those AI frameworks. So I think uh, my time's up and uh, um, thank you very much for watching. And uh, I have another talk later in the afternoon to talk about how WebAssembly can become can be used as a serverless runtime. And uh, a, a lot of this uh, that use case is already illustrated here. When we develop a, a AI inference function, we actually deploy it as a serverless function, either on our own infrastructure or in Tencent serverless or AWS Lambda. You know that allows um, application developers to just write code, upload code, and then boom, have the uh, AI inference functions in production ready for everyone to use. So um, I hope you enjoy this talk. Uh, go to our GitHub repository and github.com slash second dash state slash SSVM. Thank you very much.